Your Excellency Ambassador Gordon Gray, welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. You have spent three years in Tunisia. You came here in 2009. You came here when Ben Ali was in power. Mm -hmm. What has changed since then? Uh, maybe a different way of putting the question is what hasn't changed mm -hmm. since then. I think we've seen uh, tremendous political uh, progress. Mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about the revolution, mm -hmm. but talking about the elections that followed, the very successful elections, and uh, the transition to, to a new government. And so I think in, um, in the political sense, there's been a tremendous amount of, uh, of progress as Tunisians have been able to really for the first time participate in free and, and meaningful elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, since this is a, uh, a, an interview with the media, I think it's appropriate to point out that there have been tremendous strides in freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. um, two years ago, we would not be having this interview. You would not be able yeah, to sure. ask me these questions, and uh, you would not be able to broadcast um, broadcast the, the response. So I think there's been, been tremendous progress here. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, you've been described as the most active ambassador in the history of Tunisian-American relations. Did the revolution give you more freedom and facilitate your contact with the people because you have traveled to all the regions? Mm -hmm. Well, we always had a great deal of contact, not just me, but my, mm -hmm. my predecessors, with civil society in Tunisia. The difference was under the Ben Ali regime, mm -hmm. there was a, a risk for members mm -hmm. of civil society to engage with us, mm -hmm. and each individual had to make his or her own, her own personal calculation as to whether the risk was worth it, and that's that's a personal judgment yeah. for for the citizen, each citizen of Tunisia to make. Now, of course, um, that repression is, is no longer the case, so it's much easier for me as an ambassador, for my colleagues in the embassy, to engage with civil society, with mm -hmm. NGOs. Uh, there's no risk to the Tunisians uh, to engaging with us and, and sharing their opinions. And at the same time, we also have a very active partner in the government of Tunisia, because mm -hmm. we're, we're both working toward the same aim, which is to increase economic uh, opportunities for Tunisians, mm -hmm. and really to, um, to get back to what the American-Tunisian relationship has been historically, which is a, a partnership. Your Excellency, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, you taught English in a small lycée. Uh, or in a small mining town in Morocco. In a small lease, eh? you're, you're yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you look back at that period of your life? Oh, it's, uh, it was obviously a very uh, formative experience for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, it was my first time living in North Africa. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it was my first time living abroad. And uh, I, liked, uh, I liked my experience so much. Here I am today. Mm -hmm. So Peace Corps had just returned to Tunisia. The volunteers who should come in the late summer uh, or early fall mm -hmm. will focus on English language training and youth skills development. Right. Will they be based in Tunis? No, thank you for asking me that question. This is very important. It's um, the, um, the basis of the, the Peace Corps philosophy is to uh, interact with the citizens of the mm -hmm. host nation. Mm -hmm. And that means not just staying in the capital, yeah. but being, being throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So we're, we have Peace Corps staff on the ground now, they're setting up the programs, and we're trying to identify different locations within, um, within Tunisia so that mm -hmm. volunteers will be spread out throughout the country. Uh, Your Excellency, you've nearly visited all the regions of, of the country where the US government is investing millions of dollars in healthcare, humanitarian assistance, trade, education, agriculture, and technical assistance. Is there a priority when American officials discuss investment in Tunisia? Well, there's no, um, when you're talking about investment, do you mean private sector investment or do you mean the focus of our assistance programs? Both. Well, as far as private sector investment, we don't direct the American private sector. Our job is to explain to U.S. companies that there are many opportunities for U.S. companies to mm -hmm. invest in Tunisia. Just to mention a few that we'll be mentioning to to trade companies. We're hoping to get a trade mission here next as early as next week. Mm -hmm. um, one is franchising. 
because yeah. that's an area where American companies have a have a comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a job creator. Uh, another one is renewable energy because mm -hmm. of the, the great potential that this country has. And I think a third opportunity is partnering with Tunisian companies as Libya uh, reconstructs because there's obviously a great um, uh, great amount of totally understandable uh, gratitude from the Libyan people toward mm -hmm. the Tunisian people. There are the cultural and linguistic ties uh, between Tunisians and, and Libyans. And so I think a three-way partnership may be, um, you know, may be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. So those are oppor the opportunities for the private sector as far as focusing our assistance. We know that job creation is, mm -hmm. is extremely important to mm -hmm. Uh, to the success of the transition. It's something we hear, you mentioned before, my travels throughout the country. That's one thing that we hear consistently through the country. And so we're looking at programs that will help job creation. Are you in a way investing in democracy in Tunisia? I think that's a very good way of putting it, yes. So Secretary of State Hillary Clinton signed 100 million cash transfer agreement with Tunisia as part of the Obama administration's efforts to support the country mm -hmm. through its democratic transition. Will the US government provide more support? in the future? Oh, certainly. Um, that The $100 million cash transfer that you mentioned was an um, immediate uh, stimulus, if you will, for, mm -hmm. the, for the Tunisian economy, and it was really in response to what Secretary Clinton heard from both Tunisian officials and Tunisian civil society when she visited here uh, February 24th, 25th. Mm -hmm. We're also very close to signing a loan guarantee agreement mm -hmm. that will have uh, similarly beneficial results for the for the Tunisian uh, both the Tunisian balance sheet and the and the Tunisian economy. But we're also um, continuing with assistance in a broad broad range of issues. You mentioned the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. We've got a very good um, relationship. The U.S. and the Tunisian militaries have very good relationship. We have a robust program of humanitarian assistance mm -hmm. uh, projects developed in uh, cooperation both with the Tunisian government in some cases or with Tunisian NGOs. So we're really, um, we've got a, num a number of initiatives out there that we want to continue to, to development mm -hmm. in partnership with both the Tunisian government and the Tunisian people. You know that a U.S. businessman delegation will pay a visit to Tunisia in the coming days. Mm -hmm. Where is the goal of the visit? Well, the goal of the visit, from my perspective, is to show uh, show these companies the opportunities mm -hmm. that um, they have to invest in Tunisia, and to link them up with with potential partners. So there'll be a number of what we call business to business meetings, so that they can make those contacts. Uh, from the perspective of the companies. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to explore a new market and mm -hmm. hopefully to identify partners and maybe uh, come to agreement on, on business deals, although that's not necessarily going to happen mm -hmm. just in a few days, but yeah, it, sure. will, it will set the foundation so that those, those contracts hopefully will be signed. I'd like to talk about the political situation in, uh, in Tunisia. In October 2011, the U.S. Embassy made an effort to reach out to all members of Tunisian civil society and that includes different political parties. After nine months, does the U.S. Embassy have a preference? No, absolutely not. We don't, uh, be it during a, the campaign, the run-up to the elections, be it during government formation or afterwards, we, it's not up to us to, to select parties or, or pick favorites. It's up to the Tunisian people to do that. That's what democracy mm -hmm. is. What we support is, I think, the same thing the Tunisian people do, which is a democratic process. And um, we've worked with civil society to help strengthen that uh, that democratic process, but we do not support this this party or that party. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, how do you explain the rise of Islamists to power in the region? Is this result of oppression, of imitation? Uh, a fashionable trend, or does it emanate from a political and religious conviction? Well, I think uh, I think in in some cases that the uh, Islamist parties have been well organized, mm -hmm. and uh, that's one reason. I think in 
uh, for instance, in the case of, um, of Egypt, they, the Muslim Brotherhood was really perceived by the Egyptians as the, uh, as the sole legitimate opposition party to, mm -hmm. uh, to President Mubarak. So I think that, uh, that gave them a great deal of credibility. And, uh, and we'll see, obviously, what the Egyptian people choose in the 16th, 17th when they choose their next president. I'll ask you about, president. about Egypt as well. So the Tunisian example has shown that democracy is better digested when it comes from the masses, when it's not imposed from the outside. Do you think this applies to Libya and Egypt? Well, it, I think it's um, each, not to sound cliché, each government and each country and each situation is mm -hmm. is different. So it's very um, it's very difficult to say that a model that works in one country will necessarily work in in another country. Uh, in the United States, we have a presidential system. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's our our close neighbors, the Canadians, have a parliamentary system. Uh, they both. Our model works for us. The parliamentary system works for for the Canadians. They wouldn't think of imposing a parliamentary system on us, and mm -hmm. we wouldn't think about imposing a presidential system on on them. And but I think that for democracy to work in any country, the key is to have broad participation from from the citizenry. That's what we saw here in Tunisia, both during the revolution and then during the, um, the elections on October 23rd. And that is going to be key to the success of a democracy, be it in Libya or Egypt or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, the U.S. Department of State has often used the uh, metaphorical expression of the Arab Spring, which is a very interesting mm -hmm. expression to describe the changes in the region. Uh, do you think that today we can really talk about a spring when thousands have died, or is blood a necessary price to pay uh, in order to free the Arab world from tyranny? Well, I don't. I don't think it's a necessary uh, price to pay. I think it's uh, an unfortunate price that has been paid in in many instances, and it's mm -hmm. not just a question of here in. Uh, Certainly in our own, in the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, particularly in the 60s, there was far too much blood, blood spilled. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a requirement or that one welcomes that, but often mm -hmm. when there is uh, conflict between people striving for their rights and, uh, and, and the authorities, uh, that happens. That, again, it's not desirable, but, but sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. um, are you concerned about the uh Salafist threat in North Africa during the supporters of Sharia meeting in Qarwen, thousands who have been described as Salafists um, screamed, Obama, Obama, we are all Osama, in reference to Osama bin Laden. How does the U.S. Embassy react to such unexpected events? Well, I, I think that um, when, when observing the so-called Salafist movement, there are um, two aspects to it. One is, uh, and since it, it's it's diff I want to be careful in, in using the term yeah. Salafists because mm -hmm. it's not uh, it's not as precise a term as as perhaps uh, uh, members of uh, you know of, of CPR or Takatul mm -hmm. or Nada or mm -hmm. any other party, but I think if if we looked at uh, the gathering that you mentioned in. Uh, in Karawan, mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that it was a uh, large gathering. Yeah. It was disciplined. It was nonviolent. Mm -hmm. um, do you know? Certainly, did the American people subscribe to the beliefs of, of Osama bin Laden? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But um, freedom of speech is a universal value, and that means there is a uh, an imperative to defend it unilaterally, not just when people say things that you agree with. You also have to defend the right to, to express opinions that you disagree with or may even find extremely repugnant. Um, so again, we may not agree with the chanting, mm -hmm. and, uh, we certainly don't in this case, but um, there are two things that were notable about it. Freedom of association, which, mm -hmm. was, which we pushed the Ben Ali regime to permit, 
and freedom of expression, which we'd also push for the Benelli regime very hard to, to permit. Now, on the other side, there's the kind of violence that we saw in Chenduba, which mm -hmm. was um, ascribed to, to Salafists as well. And I think the, the government of Tunisia uh, has spoken out uh, very forcefully on mm -hmm. how that is, uh, that is unacceptable. And, and certainly uh, that is not uh, freedom of expression or, or freedom of uh, association. That's just mob violence, and that's, that's not tolerable in any society. Mm -hmm. Following the verdict of the trial of the owner of Lisma TV, Nabil Qarwi, you have expressed your concern and disappointment um, with Nabil Qarwi's indictment by the court. The Tunisian Foreign Ministry expressed surprise on behalf of the government uh, concerning your statement. Was it a mistake and a form of interference, as some observers have said, or uh, just an opinion that has been misinterpreted or magnified? Well, I. Um have to be honest with you, I don't see how it can be considered uh, interference in mm -hmm. that uh, we very carefully waited until the verdict um, the verdict was, was was issued. We did not comment on the trial mm -hmm. during any of the pre-trial hearings during the trial at all. It was only after the verdict was hearing so I don't uh, I don't understand the logic of saying it was it was interference. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to talk about the uh, situation in uh, Syria because you know that uh, we are in the same region and we can't really talk about Tunisia, Libya and Egypt without mentioning the situation in Syria. Uh, how would you describe the, the, uh, the situation in Syria? Does the theory of revolution and democracy apply to the crisis in Syria? Well, I, I, I suppose it depend, depends how you define the theory of, of democracy and revolution. I, uh, if you, the way I would define the theory of, of democracy, and certainly after mm -hmm. living here, having had some experience with both Libya and Egypt, including living in Egypt for three years, mm -hmm. I think what we've seen, even though as you suggested, the Arab Spring is a is an imprecise term, but what we've seen since uh, the revolution began here in Tunisia mm -hmm. is people in one country after another are calling for the same same thing. They're calling for the ability to participate in their government, they're mm -hmm. calling for dialogue, they're calling for freedom of expression, of association, freedom at the ballot box. And these are not, um, I would say these are not American values, these are not Tunisian values, these are not Arab values, these are universal, universal values. And for those reasons, I think we are seeing them expressed by the, the people of Syria who are trying to uh, overthrow a, mm -hmm. a very brutal dictatorship. Do you think that the, uh, the, uh, the situation in, uh, in uh, Syria is a desperate fight that will topple the regime? Is it just a matter of time before Assad falls? Uh, I, I think that, yes, I think it's just a matter of time. I, I don't know how much time, but uh, hopefully shorter as opposed to longer. But I think we saw in, in particularly vividly in uh, in Libya when a dictator starts to hunt down and try and kill his own people, he mm -hmm. totally loses legitimacy and credibility with uh, not just with his citizens, citizenry, but in the eyes of the world as well. Where is basically the difference between stepping down and stepping aside when talking about Bashar al-Assad. Uh, what do you mean? What's the Because at the beginning um, we heard some officials using the term step down and others used another term which is step aside. Today, do you think well, it's possible to accept that Bashar al-Assad steps aside? Well, it's not it's not it's not up to me as the American ambassador in Tunisia to decide. It's up to um, to the people of Syria to decide what uh, what kind of outcome mm -hmm. that they want, but we would hope that um, it would be an outcome that would uh, remove Bashar from power and, mm -hmm. and end the violence and the and the senseless killing. Yeah, and and um, it's obvious that he uh, he did not respect the decisions of the Security Council and the UN as well. How would you how would you um, respond or react? to the uh, decision of uh, Bashar al-Assad? 
Well, again, I think it's the, this, the kind of massacres that we just saw in, in Hula uh, yeah. are, I mean, it's, it's not just over 100 people who killed 49 children. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, any loss of life is terrible, but this, I mean, I'm a parent, you know, but mm -hmm. the idea that so many children's lives were lost is just, is just terrible. And again, the violence, the violence has to stop. I would like to talk about the situation in Egypt. Ahmed Shafiq, the former Prime Minister, in the last days of the rule of Hosni Mubarak, is running for presidency. He's competing with the Muslim Brotherhood's mm -hmm. candidate, Mohamed Morsi. Uh, it might seem strange, but does the United States have a preference between the two candidates? Or does it keep its distance and just observe? No, again, we don't, we don't, it's not our role to pick, uh, pick candidates. We have a long-standing friendship with the people mm -hmm. of Egypt, and We'll work with whatever government that's that they um, that they elect in the upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do have a very strong preference for is uh, is a democratic process, and we're glad to see that is starting to unfold in Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know that thousands poured into Egyptian streets late Saturday, demanding harsher punishment after uh, a court sentenced um, Hosni Mubarak mm -hmm. to life in prison. Is this fair for the thousands who have died and the? Uh, 20,000 wounded during the Egyptian Revolution. Well, I mean that's he was sentenced. He was sentenced to to life imprisonment, and uh, it's you know I think what they were protesting was the fact that it was only President Mubarak and and uh, mm -hmm. Interior Minister Adli who received sentences, and that other officials mm -hmm. uh, did not. Presumably, that will be that is under appeal. Mm -hmm. And there was widespread anger that the court acquitted Mubarak and his sons on corruption charges mm -hmm. and failed to hold anyone in the security services directly mm -hmm. accountable for the killings of uh, Egyptian democracy activists. How is the situation going to unfold as activists have called for a new revolution? Any clear scenarios? Uh, no, I don't think there are any clear scenarios, but my guess is that most of the political energy will be focused on the upcoming elections and then next steps will probably be determined by the, the government that comes out of those elections. Are you worried about the situation in Egypt? Am I worried? Uh, no, I think it's, it's... As an ambassador and as a representative well, it's of not, the government. It's not, it's not for the ambassador to Tunisia to worry about other, other countries. We've got uh, uh, one of our most distinguished uh, career ambassadors, mm -hmm. Ambassador Patterson, who served in uh, many difficult assignments throughout the world, so I know our policies in in good hands, and I think that um, you know, I think there's certainly challenges ahead, but I think uh, at the same time the trend line is good. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think um, Tunisia certainly made some some great progress as far as already having its elections, already being hard at work at, mm -hmm. um, on the constitution and. Uh, I'm pleased to see that kind of progress here. Your Excellency served as Senior Advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to Iraq from 2008 until 2009. Prior to, to this assignment to Iraq, you were Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from 2005 to until 2008. Observers say that the 2003 invasion of Iraq was the worst miscalculation in the modern history of the United States. It was certainly the right decision for President George W. Bush at that time, but the Obama administration has suffered from past mistakes. What about the retrospective outlook at the invasion? Was it the right decision? Well, I'll let the, I'll let the historians write, write that chapter and make those final, um, final assessments. Uh, at the end of the day, the decision was made. Um, mm -hmm. There were certainly great costs to the decision. Uh, at the same time, uh, brutal dictator Saddam Hussein was was removed so there were also uh, some some significant advantages that um, uh, that ensued but again I'll let the historians write that chapter. Mm -hmm. Years ago President Barack Obama traveled to Egypt he had a vision of a new Middle East uh, was his vision a dream that human beings can't realize or an objective that is coming to life with the revolution? Well, if it was a dream, I think it's a dream that the the people in the Middle East are. Uh, it resonated with them, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's. Uh, I think they're putting that dream. They're making that dream 
their own dream and, and putting it into reality. It's certainly what we're seeing here in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. You'll be leaving Tunisia in July. Um, what about your best and your worst experience in, uh, in Tunisia? Well, I think my... I'd be hard-pressed to say I had a worst experience because I certainly enjoyed uh, all three years here. I would say uh, probably the, the two memories that I will keep the longest, so the best experiences, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, one would certainly be uh, January 14th and seeing how, um, how successful the Tunisian people were, how united they were, and, uh, and all that ensued there. And then the other one, the other very positive experience that I'm, I'm sure I'll remember forever will be on October 23rd when I went to a number of, of different polling stations. And mm -hmm. You'll remember it was a beautiful day, it was, yeah. it was, it was pretty warm out, but uh, people were lined up very patiently in queues, waited for hours. Some people brought their children because it was the first time they were voting meaningfully. Other people brought, uh, brought Tunisian flags. So I think that progress along the road to democracy, be it on January 14th or October 23rd, or the, mm -hmm. is the, the two memories I'll keep, keep forever. What is your message to the Tunisian people? Well, my, my message would be, um, first of all, that the United States and Tunisia have a long history of, of partnership and friendship and, and cooperation. And now, since the revolution, we've been able to go back to the roots of our, our friendship, and, and uh, I'm very pleased with that. The uh, people of the United States are, have been very inspired by the revolution and, and look forward to continuing to, to support the transition. Mm -hmm. And my second message would be not people should not be discouraged. Democracy is hard work. Uh, we've been at it for uh, 200, almost 236 years and it's still very difficult for us, but the Tunisian people certainly have the capabilities to be successful. And the third me message would be to congratulate them on, on everything they've accomplished in the last year and a half. Your Excellency, Ambassador Gordon Gray, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.